You need new experiences in order to change the meaning of the old experiences. To just find the meaning of the old experience doesn't really help you have a different experience. You need to be touched differently to experience a touch that becomes healing and pleasurable and connected rather than just a touch that was hurtful. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is the Point of Relation. The following interview was recorded during a previous Collective Trauma Summit, an online gathering convened annually by Thomas Hubel to share ideas and inspire action for healing, individual, ancestral, and collective trauma. Visit CollectiveTraumaSummit.com to listen to featured talks from our most recent summit and sign up to be the first to know when the next summit is announced. Our guests for today's episode are Esther Perel and Jack Saul. Esther Perel is a psychotherapist and New York Times bestselling author. She is recognized as one of today's most insightful and original voices on modern relationships. Esther currently serves on the faculty of the International Trauma Studies Program and acts as an organizational consultant for Fortune 500 companies around the world. Jack Saul is a psychologist, family therapist, author, and the founding director of the International Trauma Studies Program in New York City. He has created a number of programs both in New York City and abroad for populations that have endured disaster, war, torture, and political violence. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome again to the Collective Trauma Summit. My name is Thomas Hübel. I'm the convener of the summit. And I'm truly excited to sit here with an amazing couple. And I honor you both very much. I'm sitting here with Esther Perel and Dr. Jack Saul. So most welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm really excited thank that you. we can have this conversation together. So very warm welcome here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. And you know, maybe at the beginning, like looking at the work that you both do, it's not immediately obvious how your external expression is connected to the same conversation, maybe, but we will we will explore that together. And I wanted to start with both of you, and I will hand it first to you, Esther. Like when you look at, you know, the summit deals with trauma, intergenerational trauma and collective trauma. And I know that that's part of your own personal history, but also very much part of your both work. And when we look at how does that affect intimacy, closeness, how does it affect uh, relational consciousness? How does it affect our taboos in our, in our relationship? Maybe we start there and then, and then we, we expand outwards uh, to co- more collective aspects of trauma. Maybe Esther, do you want to start us off? Mm. <laughs> um, I can start on on the personal as well as on the professional. Um, when people have experienced trauma, when the world has become unsafe, when there is an expectation that they will either be abandoned or intruded upon, neglected or uh, violated. Um, there, there is an expectation that often enters our relational awareness, which is that we expect danger, we expect betrayal, um, we expect harm within relationships. And we often actually find ourselves in new current intimate relationships that evoke these fears these expectations, but they are also evoked because we often then set it up in such a way that we reproduce that which we expect, that we don't want to expect, 
but don't know how not to expect. That would be one, um, you know, as survivors in general feel vulnerable and feel confused about what is safe and therefore it may be difficult to trust others, but at the same time, they then set it up in such a way, the loop of the dynamic in the couple or in the family sets it up in such a way that it reinforces the evidence. It becomes a confirmation bias. Um, and that is a lot of the work that I do in working with couples who bring experiences, particularly of intergenerational trauma. Mm. Mm. And so that's uh, like the, the bias that you spoke about, the confirmation bias. I think it's, a, it's an important word. I, I want to park it for a moment and come back to it later. Check. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there something that you want to add to how trauma, how we find trauma in, in the innermost circle of our experiences, couples and families? Well, no, I don't have much more to add to what Esther just said. Um, Maybe I can say a little bit about uh, just professionally um, how I kind of come, come to discover the intergenerational trauma in my work as, as a therapist. Um, uh, I, I have a, so I work as an artist, a painter, and I also, you know, use other forms of art like theater and, and audio installation in my work with survivors. And um, I didn't, a number of years ago when I was painting and working with torture survivors and survivors of political trauma, um, I didn't realize that uh, their experience would start to seep into the work that I was doing artistically. And this was a very important lesson I learned, I was already interested in the way we carry trauma in our bodies. Uh, this was many years ago. Um, I've been very interested in, in this issue, and, but never made the connection personally for me. And I was doing these interviews with torture survivors uh, at, a hospital, at Bellevue Hospital at a program that I had started in the late 90s. And, um, and some of the stories started to seep into my paintings. There's actually one of the paintings is right behind me there. Mm. And um, uh, I got to this impasse in the work that I was doing, and I couldn't go any further. I thought that I was using this as a way of dealing with my own vicarious trauma in working with these patients, but it was reaching a wall. And I didn't know what this was about. And a friend of mine, an artist, a political artist, came in to the studio one day and said, where's, you know, I'm looking at all these ambiguous narrative paintings that you're doing. Um, where is your story in this? And um, I thought about, wow, I had... Uh, had a conversation with my grandfather 15 years before about his having survived a pogrom in Kishinev in 1903. And uh, so my friend Mayer said, uh, well, said I, and my grandfather wrote me letters about that experience, the experience he had as a child in that pogrom that um, was a massacre in this village. And Mayor said, just go find your grandfather's letters and hold them. And when I went and did that and just found the letters, the whole story of my grandfather's experience hit me in this emotional way. I had been uh, working with these survivors, but not realizing that the undercurrent of the work uh, emotionally was I was, be, I was caring for my grandfather's story and what he had conveyed not only in his letters but also in um, just his the, the family dynamics and communication patterns and, and so um, and I didn't realize that uh, his grandfather 
had actually been killed at one of the Passover, Passover seders. And um, it then just threw a whole uh, way of looking at my family life into a new, a new light. And it gave me a really uh, powerful way of then connecting with the survivors of the political violence that um, I was currently working with. And I go back to that experience of how we carry these intergenerational experiences in our body. We may not know, know of them, but um, there is the possibility of finding the stories to put these bodily experiences in context. And that's been a major part of the work that I've been doing in the, in the trauma field. Yeah, that's very deep, and that's very deep. So what I hear is also that your work deepens in the moment you deepen your own relation to your own intergenerational heritage, in a way. Yeah. So that's very powerful, and I'm, I'm sure right now many people are listening that are also doing some kind of work, either therapeutic work or social impact work. So I think for many of us, the work can deepen when we start to address that in ourselves. And... Um, when you listen to check, like Esther, in your own um, family history, like your family was also affected by the Holocaust, like a, a massive collective trauma. How did that affect your work? And how did you, by yourself, you know, turn part of that around into your gift? Like check shared with us right now. So um, I am the child of two uh, sole survivors of the Holocaust. So my, both my parents lost their entire family, spent an average of five years in labor camps. Um, and for many years, I thought that my focus on this experience had to do with loss, with never having grandparents and having family, with... Um, with the massive disruption that they both had experienced in their lives, etc. But the real moment of revelation, and of course, how I carried it, what does it mean to be a child of survivors? What is the second generation? How much is my own, my, how my fears, my sense of dread, my, my way of being in the world, and all of those things affected by it. You can't know me without knowing that part of me. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how it affected our work, I was writing Mating in Captivity, and, uh, which was a book that, that explored the dilemmas of desire in modern love and used sexuality in order to understand the challenges uh, and the complexities of modern relationships. And at one point I asked Jack, I said, when you work with your torture survivors, how do you know when they come back? How do you know that they're reconnecting with life? How, you know, what, what, what are the signs? I mean, they could just be like walking dead. But what does it mean, the difference between surviving and reviving? Between not being dead and being alive? Mm -hmm. And we started talking about when people are once again able to cr be creative. Because creativity, by definition, is an active engagement with the unknown. You have to have a modicum of safety to be able to take the risk of plunging into that mystery, you know, of the creative playfulness, um, initiatives, basically going out into the world again. And I remember saying to him, that is so interesting, because in my community in Antwerp, where I grew up, I often felt that there was a certain kind of tension between families of my friends. I grew up in a community that was all Holocaust survivors. So um, it, I, I kind of had an anthropological field trip. And I remember feeling that there were homes that were morbid, homes where people were not dead, but there was a sense of you can't experience pleasure because to experience pleasure or joy, you have to have some kind of unselfconsciousness. You have to be able to not be vigilant. You can't be in dread and experience joy at the same time. And other families who were basically experiencing 
the erotic, as I began to call it, the feeling of aliveness, of vibrancy, of life force as an antidote to death. Um, some people experienced the world as dangerous, and so they were tethered to the ground. It was unsafe. You can't trust anybody. You can't, you know, and the second generation experienced the same thing. If they felt pleasure or they could instantly feel guilt <laughs> because they felt like they were not on guard and on guard was the only way that you could prevent danger. And that reality of how do you maintain a sense of aliveness? What is radiance and vibrancy in that moment? What is tragic optimism and how does sexuality tie itself into that really became the essence of my work that I Actually, if one really reads it thoroughly, I don't so much write about sexuality. I write about eroticism. What makes people stay alive? That's, that's really and that cool. is the experience of my parents. What made them stay alive for years in the camps, day after day? What gave them the desire to continue, to go on, to still find beauty, to fall in love in the camps, to have all the experiences that the human spirit will garner in order to face adversity and maintain a sense of humanity in the face of dehumanization? Wow, that's very strong. Like maybe you can both comment on uh, because I think that's also very important for many listeners. What is it actually that in such extreme situation makes us stay alive? Like what's that resourcing power? Well, what would you say are a few elements of that resourcing power that make us stay alive? Maybe you can both comment on that. I was thinking what Esther was saying about uh, creativity. You know, um, one simple way of looking at trauma is, is that it's about unmaking the world, destroying the world. Uh, I think the, the famous writer Elaine Scarry in Body, The Body in Pain spoke about this unmaking of the world. And the antidote to that unmating and destruction is making, is creating something where something may not have existed before and um, where it basically allows one to tap into one's agency again and one's imagination. And I think these are really powerful aspects of Eros that uh, we both find very important in our, in our work with uh, survivors uh, in different contexts. So, um, yeah, that's so that's and we can we'll talk more about that why we see uh, this engagement with creativity as such a an important part of uh, the process of, of healing of repair of moving on and rebuilding uh, lives after one's been through these really horrible experiences mm-hmm. so that, mm-hmm. that's Mm-hmm. Is there anything from your side that keeps us yes. besides I would, say, <laughs> I would say two things, but I will, I will echo the I mean, freedom in confinement comes to our imagination. It's true when you do yoga. It's true when you're in a camp. It's true when you're in a miserable relationship. <laughs> it's the mind. It's the ability to imagine yourself different elsewhere connected to others that will make you want to wake up in the morning. So that instantly connects to, and every report of people who have been in solitary confinement re- emphasize this as well. And, but that imagination is often an imagination that is a connective imagination. It connects us to nature. It connects us to freedom. It connects us to people. So what really, I would say that um, it is, the, the fantasy of relationships, of connection, of, of, of the people we miss, of the people we imagine thinking about us. As I am thinking about you, are you thinking about me as well now? And even though we don't know that we are rethinking about each other, we are both maintaining hope because of that. And that definitely was something that happened this year during this pandemic year, very much. Um, so. 
the fundamental of what keeps us alive is relational mm. to the self so, so, and to other. I, I would like to add something that I was thinking of as Esther was speaking, and that is um, an experience that I had uh, in working with, um, in doing a human rights documentation of Tibetan, Tibetans who had been in prison and tortured. And I remember speaking with a Tibetan Lama who had been in prison for a number of years. And um, he was out now and in India. And um, he basically said to me, the, the sign that you are really severely traumatized is when you lose the ability to have compassion for the torture. Mm when you lose the connection to the humanity in the other, in, including the perpetrator, then you will lose the connection to the humanity in yourself. So for the Tibetans, one of the main ways of practicing um, healing and uh, dealing with trauma is to practice that developing one's compassion for others and in particular, others who may have harmed one. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I've seen this in a number of different survivors who were able to come back from very severe circumstances. Uh, and that way of being able to maintain a connection to humanity, the humanity of others and one, mm -hmm. oneself which kind of goes, they go hand in hand. So that brings me to two questions when I listen to you both. Like, Everything goes in double now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it brings me to two questions, right. The, the one is, what, what's the, the moment of the unexpected in the creative act? And, and how does this relate to trauma? Like if we can, we, we touched it already a bit, but how does this relate to also trauma healing to be able to give oneself to that, to that moment where creativity can really be restarted in, in a trust in the kind of unpredictable moment. And the other one is maybe we can also talk a little bit about the the transition of like we speak a lot about the individual consciousness but something that's arising more and more is the relationality that we are live as that we are living as that we are always in relation always relational and maybe we can speak a little bit about this like seeing human beings as separate objects that live on the planet or that we are all the time in a kind of a relational state and sometimes that's very reduced or confined or absenced. And sometimes that's very open and alive. So maybe these two things, whatever feels, uh, whatever you feel attracted to speak about, but these two things I think are interesting. I think that um, it's interesting. Jack wrote the book on collective trauma and collective healing about 10 years ago, when there was no mentioning of collective trauma. Um, we've, been, we've been doing work in groups and understand that processing grief and experiences of witnessing and experiences of sharing the burdens and experiences of reconnecting with life is mostly done much better, or not much better, but in conjunction with the, the office, the clinical consulting room, that these are collective experiences. I, as a child of survivors, I can tell you, um, part of a community where most parents never went to therapy and had plenty of stuff to work on. They did it naturally by creating collective experiences. They had gatherings of the birth, people who were born in the same town, gatherings of people who came out of the same camps, and they didn't sit in groups for chat. They didn't have chat groups. They just came together. And the very act of coming together made them all know that they shared this experience and have, they didn't have to talk about it. But from that place, they could talk about life, about rebuilding, about planting trees, about naming buildings by the names of the dead. They had multitude of rituals that mm -hmm. enabled them 
to give meaning to what they had experienced and give themselves permission to have a new life again. And I think of that a lot in my work with couples and with families. We are both systemically trained psychotherapists. So in that sense, the notion that we are relational is a given. The fact that today we can connect it with neuroscience and brain and nervous systems and all of that is just further fodder for something that sociologically and anthropologically we have known forever. Mm -hmm. um, what I think goes into the, the meeting with the unknown is this. Trust, Rachel Botsman says, is an active engagement with the unknown. If you have to know all the time, you're not trusting. So by definition, trauma constricts, trauma contracts. It doesn't allow me to, to, to be touched without jumping. It, my body go, recoils. I, uh, uh, my patterns are about repetition and, and, and narrowly, you know, so I can control it all. So it's a loosening up on every level the dynamic with the interpersonal, the conversation, the communication, the body, everything. And that loosening up is an encounter with new, something that I cannot know where it's going to go, right? If I touch, if I allow myself the pleasure of my hands to be touched, what will happen once it reaches my elbow? And God forbid, what do I know about what's going to happen when it reaches my shoulder? So it's very much in the physicality, you know, trauma is expressed in the physicality, but not just inside our bodies. I look at it sexually because I think that it is a very rich language. So tell me how you were loved in the broad sense of the word, and I will tell you how you make love. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Which is not the same as tell me how you were loved and I will tell you how you love. It's about how that experience translates in the physicality of your body, how you experience, uh, you know, the, the physical connection it translates the emotional story that is behind. They're one and the same. Mm. 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 Beautiful. I, I, would, um, I would think that the connection to the unknown is most often a relational experience. I think that, um, you know, in many forms of therapy that we've seen, you know, one of the, if you, if you ever work with children and you see that if they've been through a traumatic experience, they will engage in a kind of repetitive play where they play the scene over and over again. And what enables a child to develop that narrative from the static, constricted narrative is a therapist or someone else sitting down to play with them and adding elements to the play that add a new angle to the story. Yeah. And then the child considers that new angle and then begins to consider other things that they've kind of left out of, out of their story. And the process of healing begins like that. Yeah. I do a lot of work with narrative in the narrative therapy world, where so much of that work is about helping people open up the conversation, open up letting the stories breathe so that they move from the static to dynamic, dynamic stories of the path, of the difficulties that people have had. And that's, a I think it's really, very much a dialogical process. It happens in dialogue with others. And um, it's through that dialogue that people are able often to get out of that constrained narrative about uh, one's traumatic past. Thomas, I think that this would be an interesting moment to play a clip it's, it's a clip from my podcast, Where Should We Begin?, where I basically record live couples therapy sessions. They are one-time, three-hour sessions with people who are applying for the podcast. So they've never been my patients and never will be. And this is a, a story of a couple where the man uh, who, who was um, also in Afghanistan uh, uh, basically comes back. He has four children. His wife 
uh, has a major drug problem and she also commits suicide. And he's a couple years later now and he has met this new person, this new woman. And, um, but he is completely constricted. She comes from a history of sexual abuse, but she feels that the one thing that the abuser couldn't take from her was a different relationship to her body, an ability to stay connected to her sense of aliveness. And so she yearns for him to connect with her intimately, sexually, sensually. And, uh, and it's about how I try to help him get out of this, what Jack describes, the constricted narrative. Literally, he starts by saying, I'm a kind of a fix-it kind of guy. <laughs> I stay in the practical realm. And she wants to bring him into the poetic, into the intimate, into the, you know, the place where we can feel safe, you and I together, away from the world. So let's listen. Mm -hmm. if that's Perfect. I do have a tendency to get into a, a manage the project kind of a mindset. I'm sure that talking about logistics is not that romantic, right? It doesn't evoke the erotic. But you know, a conversation where someone is deeply focused and attentive and curious is erotic mm. in the sense of you feel alive and awakened. Right. It doesn't have to be sexual. Right. Someone's focused on you. Yeah. yeah. You enter through the eyes. Mm -hmm. You enter through the curiosity. You enter into her universe. All of that is erotic. I'm going to say it in your own words. What you're asking from him. Actually, let me reframe that. What you're offering him. In my world, my inner world. There's no one else I would rather give that to than you. But I want you to desire that and not be intimidated, but to take me places that I haven't even allowed myself. Mm -hmm. I think that was the only thing I could protect my past experiences with abuse. I remember thinking I can protect this part and opening myself and saying, here I am, I'm open, you have everything, I'm not going to withhold. And Do you sing to him? I haven't in a long time. Mm -hmm. But I haven't felt the inspiration, I haven't felt the desire. And I, I don't like that, I don't like that that part of myself has gone dormant. The reason I want you to sing is because voice is crucial. Every baby recognizes a voice. Every kid who is left misses the voice. Mm. You can still see the person, you can't hear them. And when you sing to him, it does to him what it does to you when he touches you it will help him with the freezing. That's gonna fill him up. Is there a song you know you love? Yes. <clears throat> it isn't your sweet conversation that brings this Sensation. Let it go. Oh no. It's just the nearness. Yeah. I'm nervous of my voice. <laughs> Love you. There is no greater victory against a rapist than to experience full sexual and erotic intimacy with somebody else. Mm. 
that's when you can say to someone, you have not taken the best of me. And you can give that to her. I want to give that to her. Because as much as she wants to come alive, I do too. And I've been at a loss sometimes for how to get there. As long as you tell her, I do too, yeah. rather than just, I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> we're good. Yeah. Well, what do you hear? <laughs> Where does it reach you, Thomas? Yeah, definitely immediately in the connection of the voice and the intimacy of singing, which is a very vulnerable act, and it mm. invites immediately a mutual space into the room between them. So that reached me immediately when, when I listened to that to the moment, you know, mm. like how it creates immediately an intimate space. And also, I think that the vulnerability of giving something through the singing, like a creative energy into the space. So that's, that's beautiful, lovely. I, I like the, it's like the, the unconventionality of the process is very interesting. So the, that's, that's a beautiful example of that moment of trusting into the unknown. Uh, so and of creativity. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment a little bit for our listeners or do you want to leave it that I way? Think, I think that what I would say is, so you see, he's frozen. But once she starts to sing, because mm. it's so primary, because that, you know, and um, he, he, he can't stop it. He just... Is, is, you know, he can release, basically. And then from the release, he can say, I too want this. Instead of just saying to her for years now, I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> I mm -hmm. can't do it. I'm not like you. You know, th this is not the usual conversation. So the narrative, as Jack just spoke about, gets totally changed. It goes from, it switches from the, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm a matter of fact kind of guy. You know, what do you want? to, I want that too. <laughs> and mm. now we are in a space where we can meet and we can find one another. And often I think that um, trauma work is often, um, in, when I see it with my, with my students as well, the, the focus is on the trauma work. And I think that what I began to do from watching the community that I grew up with was that I began to do the work on the side of the erotic, on the side of the, 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 the reconnecting um, and in an experiential way. You need new experiences in order to change the meaning of the old experiences. To just find the meaning of the old experience doesn't really help you have a different experience. You need to be touched differently to experience a touch that becomes healing and pleasurable and connective rather than just a touch that was hurtful. Erotic recovery is about control, pleasure, and connection in the full sense of the word. You know, but it is Holly Richmond's work on sexual recovery that I refer this to and I then made it broader because I think these three words are really, you could translate the word control into the word agency, self-determination, tragic optimism. There are other words that go into that bucket. Connection, yes, we understand relatedness, trust, etc., And then pleasure, which is adventure, novelty, change, mystery, mm -hmm. imagination, creativity, that side of our lives. Those two fundamental sets of human needs must be put together. And that these days, the focus is only on the safety and not enough on the risk. <laughs> or the notion is you can only take the risk if you are safe, which is, of course, a given. But you can only experience the pleasure if you take the risk. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. You need, you need attachment f to experience separateness, but it is the separateness that will link you to desire. Mm. And, 
And uh, you said also something before, and maybe that's a, also something for you both to comment on, is because you, you brought it beautifully to the level of ritual, to the level of collective coherence building, to the level of collective resilience that we deal with trauma in collective spaces has a power. And that's definitely also my experience also with, with a lot of Holocaust work. And so maybe can you both speak a little bit to the power of ritual and the power of social healing environments that are set up to create those resilient spaces? What's needed there that it, it becomes like a, a fertilized so space? I, yeah, I'd like to talk about um, kind of what we did over 20 years ago that I think was a really great lesson in working with trauma at a collective level for both of us. Um, while I was run, uh, running this clinic for torture survivors um, in New York, um, I saw that many of the survivors um, wanted something more than just talking about their experience in the intimacy of the office. Uh, they actually wanted to speak with the public, to connect with people outside of their own refugee or immigrant community and they wanted people to know what they had been through um, so we started a theater project to invite um, refugees who had been tortured uh, to come tell their story to an ensemble of actors who would listen to them interview them about what they had been through, uh, get into what their physical manifestation of the story would be. And then the theater group would work improvisationally um, to uh, develop theater pieces about their experience. And Esther was one of the actresses in that early group. I was kind of the producer of it. Um, and we, originally uh, had a number of different groups coming, but there was a group that we started working with very intensely. And these were um, uh, survivors of torture and imprisonment under Augusto Pinochet in Chile. They'd been living in the United States for over 15 years. Uh, many, they rarely spoke about their experience to other people, you know, in their lives are, are Americans and um, or their children or their children or, or and never spoken about their to their children so um we started doing this work over four months and it was interesting how it evolved I mean first they did want to tell the story of the pain the traumatic experience of being tortured and they wanted to see it represented theatrically but when we brought it back to them, you know, improvisationally, they then said, oh, but you reminded us of how we survived in the prison by creating these strategies of staying connected with each other and knocking on the wall. We would pass messages in, through, in the refrigerator, in the lettuce, you know, and um, they had all these ways of maintaining this collective resilience and this connection with other people. And so then we would do pieces, theater pieces about that. And then it would just go on and on unfolding these uh, wonderful ways that they had of um, connecting and connecting to those things which enabled them to survive and have meaning in their life and continue to have purpose with others and even uh, humorous stories about their relationship with the torturers. That's something we would have never even thought of asking about. Um, so that would come out as well. And as we were doing this work, um, there was a lot going on between these survivors. There was four, four three men and a woman we were working with. Um, they started to report to us that they had spoken to their children for the first time about their experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, they were connecting with other people in the community. And uh, there was kind of this rippling effect that was going on 
uh, in creating new connections and opening up communication. And um, when we then were uh, planning to have a performance of the play, they asked if they could, their kid, they said their children wanted to come and read letters and poetry to them before the play. Because now their children had this appreciation and understanding of what they had been through and really saw them in a fuller light. And it was just a beautiful part of this event. Um, and we've continued to work with this group uh, almost for 20 years in some way. Uh, they, uh, some of the Chileans it, it have actually attended my recent work on moral injuries. Um, and um, so it's been an ongoing project. And, um, and I think it really is one kind of a model or prototype of what doing a kind of um, ritual, artistic ritual with a group can lead to. And um, mm. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that work, Esther. No, I think we can. Mm. It's, it's led to us doing a number of these kind of theater projects since then, and including one with New Yorkers after 9-11. Um, mm. and wow. as we just had the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center right. we were we've been revisiting some of that theater work as well I think that that uh, the the one thing i would highlight from what you described jack is the is uh, it's part of the work focusing on on the creativity on the ritual on the erotic as a way to working with the with trauma is humor. And one of the clips I was watching uh, from the play that we did after 9-11 is actually me on a couch, uh, being the child of survivors, um, you know, wondering if I even have a right to have a story because I've never suffered enough. You know, my suffering is not nearly as big as my parents and not nearly as big as anybody who was in the towers. And this whole, but it's done with dark humor, with dark humor. Um, and, uh, um, and I think that um, that is a piece that we often shy away from. You know, when you, the, the survivors often will have stories that are very funny because they're tragic, not because they're funny. And, um, and uh, the work is often very, very serious. And I think that if we can tap into that other side, we open up a whole other channel for healing. Yeah, in a good it's sense. A really like, important source of creativity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, for example, I, I saw a couple recently and they were having drag out fights, really, you know. And so at one point I just said, you know, could you lay down on the floor, both of you, you know? And uh, I don't know if you know, but it's very hard to have a fight when you're lying horizontally. <laughs> and uh, because we are primates, you know, we attack, we need to be upright. <laughs> and uh, they laid down, and of course, we started laughing. And, um, and it changed the entire rest of the session. It's like, okay, because once they laid down, I said, now continue your fight. And they couldn't. And so then it entered into this whole other side, right? Just the vulnerability, the grief that is behind the rage. Um, and you have to dare to just, dis, you know, create the discontinuity and just say, you know, Let's change. But if you really want to work with the body, it's not just tracking what's happening in the body. It's using the body as a full instrument for change. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Like, I, I, I want to ask something. When I listen to both of you, it seems like you said something, Esther, I think before in the clip you said it, that like, uh, like a level of presence becomes like a participation in your world and that that's erotic and when i listened to you check before i had a feeling that like besides hearing the opening up of the group how the the energy and their aliveness starts to spread and open up and and reconnect to the community to the children and so it seems like also the 
the level of acting is also like a participation in the world, like in the inner world of the people that experience the traumatic, whatever the torture, for example. And can you say a little bit more about this, like how we are willing to participate in each other's experience, this this deeper attunement? Can you speak to that part? How this is, part a, this of is a really, so I think you're making a really good, a really important point. There's something about when you take in a person's story and then you spend hours working improvisationally to bring that story to the public and find the universal elements in their story and take their gestures and you convey to the person that you have listened. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that one of the most powerful things that we can do to heal is compassion, is engage in the process of compassionate listening. Because in most, in most of the work that I do artistically with communities, it starts with this level of acknowledgement and listening. They need to know that what they have been through is deeply acknowledged by the, whoever the witnesses are. In the case of the work that we do, we bring the public in as witnesses and we engage the public to compassionately listen to the um, survivors. Then we move on. To, Jack, Jack, um, I think that yeah. it would be a great moment to actually describe what happened this weekend. Yes. Because that is such an incredible example of um, like so I, um, <laughs> So I, I was going to present, a, maybe I need to back up because I'm going to present a little clip. Should we talk about the moral injury mm -hmm. uh, project? Please. Because this Please. is, um, and then I can set the context for a beautiful um, example of using a community healing ritual mm -hmm. that took place this weekend with um, Iraqi refugees and veterans of the Iraq war. Um, I'm just going to play you a clip from this, the Moral Injuries of War Project. This, these are interviews with um, war correspondents and veterans who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're speaking about their moral dilemmas, their ways in which they're morally injured. Um, I, I think, I don't know if people are familiar with that term, but it's um, a term that we, has been around since, for 50 years since the Vietnam War. Um, the psychiatrist Jonathan Shea coined the term to describe the, um, the feelings of shame and guilt one may feel from having um, engaged, participated in, witnessed, not been able to stop morally reprehensible acts, or having been betrayed by a leader that asked uh, ask one to engage in morally reprehensible acts. And moral injury is an aspect of trauma that is deeply um, painful and probably leads to most of the suicides among veterans. Um, this is what was recognized for the Vietnam veterans and I think has been recognized now uh, with the re veterans of the recent wars. In the past 20 years, it just came out recently in a report that four times as many veterans have suicided than were killed in combat during the global wars on terror. This is a very serious problem. It's been described as a wound to the soul. It's not, it, it comes in addition to post-traumatic stress disorder. It can be in, as well, in, instead of post-traumatic. You don't have to have PTSD to have moral injury. These are problems of conscience rather than problems of fear or anxiety or a sense of threat. So um, in doing this work with, um, I've been working with war correspondents for 18 years, and I noticed that many of them were struggling with moral distress. And 
I started to become interested in this and started working with veterans as well. And then wanted, then wanted to look at this as a collective trauma. This is not just an internal experience. It's a, it's a collective experience. Um, and it really needs to include the public witnessing what these people have experienced during the war. And we know when the people who've experienced moral injury come to a public, then the public can acknowledge what they've been through and, in, and share in the responsibility for what has happened. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, really healing for these people. So I just want to put For the shame, so we, especially. Yes, they can overcome some of the shame uh, in being uh, given this kind of context for uh, speaking. So here's a little clip. We, we did, um, I think you may see um, people listening to this. This was first um, put in a Arts and Ideas Festival in Romania at the National Museum of Art. And people would come in and listen to maybe 20 minutes and then go and we would collect their uh, responses afterwards and, and integrate the responses of the, of the public into the installation itself. So we can start this a short clip. Didn't have anybody to speak frankly about what was going on. And as a journalist, my role is to be critical while everybody else in the environment is about not questioning and you're not allowed to question anything. No matter what now, I always think that there's room for diplomacy. I think that war altogether is absolutely unnecessary. So I've just become more cynical about all the conflict around the world. The cynical part of me wants to un wants the public to understand that it's your fault. We are all complicit in all of this horror. I don't need other people to experience my pain. I need other people to understand that they are complicit in my pain. I can hold my pain myself, but other people need to understand that they had a part in causing it. But this weekend, um, what what took it, we took it, uh, Jack took it a, a level further, which was that it a group of Iraqi refugees together with veterans build a mudif, a mudif which is the oldest structure in Iraq that is a guest house, a, a refuge, a place where people come to have difficult conversations. And um, for the 20th anniversary of 9-11, they came together and then they played the moral injuries of war um, installation as a way to begin a conversation. And um, one of the people who was there of the Iraqi refugees for the first time actually wept and had and allowed himself to feel and could talk to his family. And so I think that when, even when you have a collective experience, it goes right into what you tell your partner. Often your partner has never seen any of it, has never heard, just knows that you scream at night, so just knows that you wake up. To, you know, or just knows that you're frozen. And then your children, they who feel like you sit on something, there are things that they can't talk about. They know what not to ask. It, this is the ripple effect of intergenerational. It's not the intergenerational just from the past to now, it's from the now to what then goes further. And it's that, that, um, it's that transmission that one hopes to, to, um, to open up. So how do you break the silence? There's so many ways in which silence can, you know, be a response. I mean, sometimes it's, a, it's an important positive response, but in many times, um, as in the case of the moral injury, uh, people 
are afraid to speak about what they've been through. Either they want to protect their loved ones from knowing some of the horrors that they've experienced, or um, they fear that they would be seen as unpatriotic or critical of the military. And this is a very, this makes it a very serious problem. I think now we, we're starting to realize that moral injury is also a consequence of our war culture in our society in the United States. We glorify war and violence. And if you go against it, if you talk about what war is really like and convey to the public the horrors of war and um, the ultimate destructiveness, then you could be retaliated against. So a, a lot of the people are afraid to even speak because um, they're afraid of breaking that silence and, and having, you know, be punished in some way. And it's very real. So this project really is about how do we create spaces for the difficult conversations that we need to be having as a society. The veterans are the prophets who are bringing to us, they're the, the messengers that are bringing to us the truth about war. And um, their healing depends on their being able to speak to a public and have that public acknowledge what they've been through. Uh, I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh said that veterans are the tip of the flame of a match that enlightens the way for a society to understand what war is and to find a way toward peace. And it's really incredible to see the role that veterans, the important role that they have to play in bringing this reality to the public. And it, it, it makes me think about one of the functions, you know, I, I, I think that there's an adaptive function to PTSD and moral injury. Uh, from a social perspective, it may be an, by, you know, a way that we have developed through evolution, a way of not forgetting events. There are people who continue to be haunted by the memories when maybe the society wants to move on and not think about what they went through. These people actually uh, inspire the, 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 the public, the society to uh, grapple with these truths uh, if, and take care of them. And the way that they can, they do that is bringing those people back into community and hearing what they have to say. There's so many different versions of that kind of healing ritual in many different cultures where communities uh, find ways of bringing the people who have been harmed the most back into community. And it often involves listening to what they have to say. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking that one of the, the I mean, you're, you're doing something different because you're, you're um, truth sayers, you're sufferers, um, Hermes, they're like messengers. Um, and they, they deliver the message from, you know, from the wounded to the, to the witness. Um, and then they share in responsibility. But I think that the part of what we are both doing, you know, we, we both are clinicians and we work in our office and we help people in multitudes of ways. We are more narrative, so we deal with their stories. We try to open, etc. But we are very aware that there is something about the office that is a problem-ridden environment in which you come to experience your pain in isolation, maybe with the therapist, but still in isolation. And especially, you know, I do it around couples' life. Couples today are more isolated than they've ever been. There's never been more expectations on this unit of two, and there's never been less information about how to do it. And, uh, and the podcast was 
let me, you know, there's fake news all over the place. Social media people posture and, and, and screen their, their lives. What about actually letting people hear the place where nobody ever goes? I think that's where we are uh, similar. We go to the place, we bring to the people, to the community, the voices and the stories and the truths of places where people never go. What happens when a couple close their door and nobody knows? You don't even know when your best friends are about to divorce these days. You didn't see it coming. And the village doesn't have the narrow streets anymore where you could hear every fight and every makeup in the neighbor's house. You don't have any idea what goes on in your neighbor's apartment. And so it's that. It's that we understand that there's a form of therapy, of therapeutic experience that takes place by taking those conversations outside of the office and putting the personal drama into a public space. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that really hits the core. I think because I deeply am convinced that what you're both saying is so essential for our collective healing and that to create this kind of collective witnessing uh, in, in both ways, like that you shared now, is absolutely crucial for uh, societal evolution and development. And also, when you speak about, check what, I, what you said, it's really fundamental, I believe. I think in order to evolve beyond the war culture that we have, we have to, you know, bring that collective witnessing and the, and the veterans back together in order to, to open up the denial of our societies. And I think that that's such an important work. I just want to underline what you both said, that I think that that's so crucial for like how the, the interdependence of the individual and the collective, that they are not separate, but they are interdependent. And I think that principle of healing is so crucial. And you both express this in different ways, but very powerfully. Um, just when we, like something that's, you know, the, the anniversary of, where the 20 years of 9-11 is up very much. But also, like, when we see what's happening right now with troops leaving Afghanistan and what's happening in Afghanistan, how that's, that's I think, on the mind of so many people, and I'm sure many people who are listening in right now would immediately think of that when, when we speak about what we speak about. Is there anything that you both want to comment on, like, how we, as a collective given all what we spoke about uh, individually and collectively relate to what's happening? I, I would say that this moment here, this coinciding of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and, and 9-11, the 20th anniversary of 9-11 has evoked many conversations now about war as a response to those, those that tragedy. I know that, you know, it, it was felt very strongly by many of the people in our community where we live near the World Trade Center. And our mm -hmm. children went to the school two blocks north of the World Trade Center and saw everything, along with all the kids that day, saw the people jumping and falling out of the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had to run away from the debris storms from the buildings falling and we were evacuated from the school and then displaced from our community for a while and um, I think that there was a sensitivity at that time among people in our community uh, to what happens to civilians in a political conflict and I think that we really the idea of going to war was for us, uh, uh, just seen as not, you know, the way to go about this. We were engaged in the process of trying to find meaning, create some collective meaning about what had happened. And unfortunately, the whole thing got hijacked by the global war on terror narrative and really interrupted a process of collective narration and coming to terms with what had happened. And I think we're still stuck there. Um, maybe we can go back and deal with this. I think we, we've heard a lot of people speaking about uh, the reasons for going to war, the, re, you know, the, 
the now the effects of having gone to war. We've spent eight trillion dollars in the last 20 years, which could have gone into building resources into our own society. And it's left very little in those countries except destroyed infrastructures. And um, and almost 900,000 people killed. We, we went from a national tragedy or atrocity to a global catastrophe. And I think that that reality is not one that's very easy for people to come to terms with. Um, I hope that the opening can last a bit longer, but we, as a country need to have a national reckoning process about war. We don't do it. We just go, get into a war and then we move on to the next one. We never learn the lessons from the previous wars. And this is one of the goals of our project is to promote a kind of national reckoning process uh, about war and have citizens become engaged critics about about this. We should not be just um, avoiding and not involved because we're not experts about war. We need to be experts. I almost feel like I shouldn't add anything to this, Jack. This is a very strong um, statement to, to end by. Um, mm. But I, 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 I will actually, because since we are you know, also clinicians. I think that um, I'm, I, I, I would really w want to invite, and this is actually what I will do this year as part of my um, professional um, conference, uh, Thomas, um, which I'm hoping <laughs> to talk about with you as well. Um, it's called the great adaptation. Um, how we stay grounded when the ground is moving. And I think mm. one of the very important things that happened in the last two years is that both as clinicians, we are experiencing a parallel process to what our patients are going through, through climate change, through the disasters, the floods, the fires, through, the, through BLM, through racial reckoning, through um, the pandemic. There's so many large things that are once again entering the world is once again entering therapy after having had two decades where in a way we spend more time talking about other parts that are very important that have to do with the brain, that have to do with attachment processes. And we left the big events of the world and how they actually are affecting what happens in our kitchens and our bedrooms. And we were forced we were forced amongst us as clinicians to reckon with this and to talk about structural trauma and to understand where it affects us. Um, so collective trauma is not just what happens to the people out there, away from us. We are in it. it there's different ways of it that it affects us as therapists and that we are having conversations with our patients about this today that we didn't have before. Um, so the the process of therapy itself is changing because the world is once again a central character in the therapeutic process. Mm, you're so beautiful. It's so lovely to listen to both of you. I could go on for hours. It's so, because it's so true, it's so to the point. I mean, many things you both said, I think are very precise and uh, very much also the, the beauty how you riff off each other is very beautiful to see and also the precision of your both expression. It's very touching. It's a deep, it's a deep conversation. I'm a bit sorry that we have to end our conversation now. And it, it was very inspiring for me and also the depth of the transmission that's in the room, you know, as we go deeper is, is, is very beautiful. And I think you're doing both amazing work and I want uh, your work to be blessed and to you know expand because I think it's uh, deeply meaningful it's meaningful to me and I think it's meaningful to everybody who is listening right now so thank, thank you so you. much for joining our summit thank you <laughs> thank it was you. beautiful Bye -bye. both of you thank you Bye -bye. visit collectortraumasummit.com to listen to more talks like this one and to sign up and be the first to know when the next Collector Trauma Summit is announced 
Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.